Oh my. <laughs> well, I hope you feel like that at the end as well. Um, I feel like of all the people talking on the pulpit, um, I'm the one who's not preaching to the choir <laughs> because I'm talking about corporate data science as opposed to indie data science, which I think is what a lot of you folks here are, are more interested in, uh, in terms of vocation, but mostly in terms of what works and what doesn't. Unfortunately, that's not my background. My background is very much in the corporate world. I have several reasons for it. Some of them I'm not super proud of. They're a little bit cowardly. Some of them are, well, if I'm gonna go down this route because I need health insurance, then I'm gonna make a change from the inside and become the fifth column. <laughs> So here is sort of my feel good. Here's sort of my feel good slide about um, why I think that this is an appropriate approach for for this d division of labor. I think um, people are really, really quite happy when they can afford to buy the Asian pear instead of the Macintosh apple just because they want and not because it's cheaper or more expensive. And I think that's there are different drivers for different humans. Some humans really are driven by that competitive uh, monetary component of, of data excellence and technical excellence, and some of them are not. And after much therapy, I'm kind of in the middle. I kind of like being able to afford things, but, um, but I also don't think that that should be incumbent upon uh, whole swaths of other humans not being able to do what they want. So. It's a challenge, I'm in therapy. I'm sure many of you are as well. But my point here is that there exists uh, a sweet spot where you can find somebody who has a need for what your talent is. That person is also willing to pay you. Those normally don't go hand in hand. Uh, and it's because you have a vocation that solves a particular problem. And it's a pro problem that somebody has said, this is valuable enough to me that I will help solve it. Be that the Sloan Foundation, the Gates Foundation, um, or, you know, the, the Republic of, of Brazil, which is where I'm from. So this is sort of the, the genesis for why I think that I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about what it, what it feels like to live behind the, the, the curtain. Uh, and I'm gonna let you guys see Oz, uh, the corporate curtain. So anyway, this is one of my favorite slides. This is, um, I don't know if you guys know who the Grook is, any hands? Oh, this is awesome. So I will be the person who introduces you guys to the concept of the Grook. The Grook is a security uh, engineer. He talks quite a bit. He is very well known in the field and nobody knows his actual name. I tried quite hard to figure it out, but of course I was very unmatched. Um, so I'm gonna leave his, his handle there and exercise to the reader, figure out who he is. But he's very smart. Uh, and he does a lot of, of counterintelligence, uh, if you're into that. But the point of this slide is that context in data is everything. So how many of you can see the cow? Don't tell your neighbor if you see the cow. Okay, let's flip it. Who cannot see the cow? Right? But here's the thing. Once you see the cow, you won't be able to unsee it forever. I came across this picture 16 years ago and I still use it because it's phenomenal. For those of you who can't see the cow, that's an eye, that's an eye, that's another eye, that's his, his or her ear, an ear right here, some nostril action down here. <laughs> and so that, that context is really what you're seeking, is the ability to see the whole and identify the parts that are descriptive, that allow you to get uh, a greater picture uh, of the problem or of the solution or of the, the data set, uh, to stretch the metaphor. But this is, in essence, what we're doing behind the scenes in, the, in corporate America, corporate Europe, corporate geography, um, which is very similar to the work that happens in, in the indie world. So since data without uh, context is useless, why don't I give you guys a little bit of context. So my background is I'm a recovering data scientist. I have been doing data science for many, many years without a PhD, it's possible. <laughs> and um, and what, um, what I have learned over the years is that 
um, controlling numbers and controlling code, it's, it's impossibly difficult, it's doable, but it's very difficult. But the thing that got me really excited to get up in the morning was, was getting people to do those things, programming people, which sounds Machiavellical, but it's really not. It is, what's the meta level at which I'm not the one telling zeros and ones what to do, but I am bringing together a team of people who can produce uh, a, t a whole that is bigger than the sum of the parts. Now, the difference between indie data science and corporate data science is that you work for the man. Um, the, it, it's not personal, it's not academic, it's a business, and it's cutthroat, and it's cruel, and it takes, a, it takes an inhuman amount of effort to live it and still maintain your kindness and your integrity uh, and, and, your, and your soul to, to really get at the point of what it is. But how can you do this in a way that, is, is, that maintains your integrity? So these are the three things that I'm gonna talk to you guys about. How is it that, the, that we data science in industry and what are the similarities with indie data science? And then how do you build effective teams that can solve both industrial problems as well as civic problems, um, government problems, um, legal problems uh, from a data, with a, with a data bend. And then lastly, I'll talk about what you do to keep that going and so that it isn't something that disappears uh, at, at every cycle of regeneration of whatever administration or whatever management upline you're dealing with. So some things don't change. That's the, um, that's the, 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 the first thing between the two. You still have to deal with data collection. You still have to deal with data exploration. You have to clean it. You have to transform it, ETL it, model it, validate it. You gotta communicate it somehow. You gotta deploy it. You gotta understand it after you've deployed it so that you can undeploy it and redeploy it after you've done all sorts of um, uh, modifications and edits to it that when you push the notification, like small bugs fixed, and it's like 122 megabyte update. It's still the same. Um, the, the, I don't know if you guys know who um, Ed, Eduardo Arino de la Rubia, Ed um, is from, he's with Domino Data Lab and he gave a really cool presentation at TDWI a, couple, a month ago actually. But this is, it's recorded, you should watch the whole thing, he's brilliant. But this is the part that I wanna focus on and it's not even his slide, he stole it, so I'm stealing it from him. Um, this is um, Gillard Pafka's slide on the cycle of understanding and all the bits and pieces that uh, data science teams end up being responsible for, whether they want to or not, it sort of falls on them. And if you're really lucky, you have a team of data engineers. I've heard some awesome names today, data plumbers, uh, data, um, what was the best one? At the, I'm not gonna remember, I'm sorry. But there were some really good names. Um, but this is essentially what we're doing, either in industry or, uh, or independently. Here's where it changes a little bit. The piece that is a little bit nuanced in the industry world is the introduction of production software. Either this be production software that you sell, that you put a price and put on shelves, or production software that powers the internal processes within uh, your department or within cross-departmentally. Um, uh, an example here would be improving the logistics with your contract manufacturers when you're talking to folks who are putting your robots together uh, across the world. So where, where does data science need to fit once you're behind the curtain? And I'm telling you guys all of this uh, a little bit because I think maybe you wanna go work for uh, an industry at some point, a, a corporate entity at some point, and I'm absolving you of the fact that there are good guys out there, so uh, find those but also uh, because there's a lot of, of information that, that is nicely transferable. So this is a particularly transferable one because let me tell you a story about siloed data. What a lot of independent uh, data scientists have to deal with, and we've heard lots of stories about this here today, is that a particular uh, organization has some of the data and then a particular department within the civil organization has some data and then the, the town hall has some data and then the police department has some data. The exact same thing 
is mimicked in the microcosm that I work in. You have finance, you have IT, you have ops, you have legal, you have marketing, you have engineering, you have product, and this is, this is sort of a poetic licensed amalgamation of all the bits that are present in, in a post-startup uh, stage. And this is where data science has to work once you are inside which means whatever domain expertise you think you had goes out the window 70% of the time. You may be really, really, really good at parsing and doing NLP on contracts so that you can identify areas that increase your risk of takeover or, or any kind of, of financial uh, problems, but that's not the first project that you're going to be working on because that's not the highest priority to the business. And the business dictates that you're going to now be working on improving legacy product and making it more resilient and stable. Yay, all that money that went to law school. <laughs> you can't use it anymore, at least not for a while. So almost every organization that I've worked at, there's, there's PDFs and emails and CSVs if you're lucky. Uh, proprietary spreadsheets, and they're strewn across departments, locations, fiefdoms, levels. There are people who left and store them, and somebody forgot the password of where the thing was stored, which is great, because there was a password. Because <laughs> you wouldn't believe also the amount of data that is just floating internally, and everybody's just like, oh, well, we're all one company. What could go wrong? And then you have to tell them that, you know, people sometimes break up with a significant order, a significant other, and they become slightly disassociative, and then they have really interesting ideas that they can follow through, and the enemy is within. So you have to protect your data from your own people. Uh, when you're working on altruistic projects, that's less of a concern. When you're working in, in corporate America, you have to lock this stuff down. And I would have cursed. This is magical. <laughs> There's a power here. <laughs> All right, some things change quite a bit. So once you go into these large organizations um, here, it's, it's complicated sort of on purpose because that's the message that I'm trying to send is that it, it gets complicated very quickly because, um, because of Gaul's law, you have things start simply and then you start adding appendages to it and adding dependencies and, and using it for purposes that it wasn't intended to be used for. So up there I have um, the architectures of Facebook is there, Pinterest is there, Quora is there, Airbnb is there, um, Twitter is there. So very, very, very complicated uh, data infrastructures require uh, data analytic skills that allow you to navigate through all of those different uh, mappings of how the data operates and there's some skill there. Um, there's, there's definitely some programmer and data analyst skill, but there's also some overarching skill of how do you build the best symphony with all of your folks who are your violinists who are really great at dealing with queuing uh, data ingestion pipelines into your, your computational uh, lambdas. I, I live in the serverless world now, so there are people who are really good at understanding all of that piping and plumbing, and those people are worth their weight in, in magical fairy dust. Very hard to find. Then you have folks who are incredible analysts, but they come from the school of thought that I came from, which is, pfft, who cares? The truth is truth. Just give me the numbers and I will find truth. And after a couple of years, you eat a lot of crow and you realize that's not how it works. Um, because um, what ends up happening is you start having these unicorns. Did it flash? I put the special um, animation there because unicorns deserve special animation. So what ends up happening is you hire this unicorn who is capable of doing everything and you don't change any of the culture uh, beforehand and so the, the unicorn shows up for a meeting and everybody in that meeting is like, why is the unicorn here? We're not ready for the unicorn. We, we have all of these other problems that we have to deal with and this unicorn is just going to make everything complicated and difficult and it's all going to be about this one person and they're going to be the 10x developer and they're going to be the stopgap through which every decision and all of a sudden you've created an incredibly dysfunctional team. Um, 
In fact, what you want to, to acknowledge is that you have blended objectives. So I'm going to wonder a little bit, and I think that might have a problem with, let me see if I can not wonder. This is, this is so hard. I'm such a wanderer. Uh, okay, so up here I have a two by two where most, most projects are, are divided uh, in these in these quadrants where you either have your team working on novel things, things that are not on the market, that they're super secret, that you can't open source, they're the crown jewels. And then you have sometimes the same team at a different point in time or sometimes half of your team working on something that is very legacy, very understood, it's your money maker, is the thing that you, you issue pager duties for, right? Like this one is the one that cannot go down ever. And then you have this other dimension to, to this two by two, which is doing R&D, which are things that are inherently uncertain, they're iterative, it's, these are, this is the side that's much harder to, to explain to senior management why so much money is getting sunk in there. Uh, very smart uh, senior management understands the ROI, the return on investment that you get here, but junior ones don't and they continue to challenge what the point is. Uh, and then you go from very ad hoc processes of, um, of these, these iterative processes all the way to production scale. And when you hit production scale, it has to be resilient. It has to be reliable, it has to be able to scale, and it has to never, ever, ever crap out unless, <laughs> unless a, a vendor of yours will stay unnamed because I love them and they give me discounts. Um, <laughs> when, when they go offline, then, you know, that's no good. So p the first thing that I want to say in terms of the differences, but things that, that learnings that can be applied uh, in, the, uh, in the independent data science world is that when you are working on, on something that is at the production scale, you tend to work on it from a very legacy mindset of don't break it for the love of God. Uh, and just make it run at scale. And um, my position is that that's a, that's a huge waste of resources because that is something that is really well understood and, and you could push the limits there and you could bring that very well understood process and turn it and reframe it as an R&D process. So that will generate things like improved optimizations of, of the code, improved performance of the code. When was the last time that that code got refactored for, for the 13th instantiation of the architecture that you have no control over because if you're lucky you have a dedicated team of data engineers fiddling with that. Uh, and, and on the, the other direction, you also have um, legacy uh, projects that you could push into production and you can improve the delivery in, into production. You can in, introduce things like continuous deployment because obviously the first time this was done it was a version 0.8 and it works, it makes money and it's going to go into version 1.0 in two fiscal years. No, you can actually have all of that, that embedded knowledge um, and, and turn that into uh, novel approaches for using the legacy understanding. Um, likewise, the same thing happens on the top left, where you're usually doing things in R&D that they are going to end up becoming intellectual property that, that the company is going to hoard. Um, but what you can do is you can push it towards uh, intellectual property that is not core to the business, but that is valuable to the community, and that's what you start to open source. Um, so there are, there are definitely uh, places where uh, combinations between, you know, the Darth side of the force, me, uh, and, and the Jedi can work together. <laughs> so that's what doing data science in industry is. Uh, I have all sorts of other things that I am very excited about, none of which I can talk to you about because um, we haven't launched it yet and it hasn't been vetted by PR. It's the name of the game, I signed up for it. Um, okay, so how do you build effective data science teams that, that are capable of delivering on that promise? Um, who's playing the bingo, the data science bingo? Anyone? You can mark Drew Conway's Venn diagram on your, on your boards, there you go. 
So the, the data scientist archetype is this is archetype of this magical beast that can just do all of the hacking and knows all of the math and has studied statistics with rigor and has substantial domain expertise from having spent 65 years trudging through the jungles of soybean and trade introgression. That's what it turns into. Did it flicker again? Yeah. Okay. So, and, and my point there is that this is bull. I mean, no offense to, to Drew. Drew, 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 that Venn diagram for a very specific reason, which I've stolen to bastardize, so this is not on him, but it sets up my joke really nicely, which is that unicorns have a very specific intuition, which it is not accurate, because it is not the cumulative experience of the rest of their team. So when you drop a unicorn into a room of data normies, by what, I'm a data normie, so I mean that with the utmost respect. Um, it just simply doesn't work very well because what, what ends up happening is you, unicorns don't exist. They don't. You have llamas, which we might or you know, not be able to, to pet soon enough in less than 24 hours. Um, but you have zebras and you have horses and you have giraffes and you have gazelles and you have all sorts of different beasts that offer uh, different perspectives, that bring different gifts to the team, that look at things in ways that you'd never imagine. Which brings me to yet another piece uh, that, uh, of, of insight that's really key. Who here has heard of super chickens? Oh, wow. So um, XKCD has this one magical little drawing that he does where he talks about the joy of introducing a room of very smart people to a concept that they haven't seen yet just by virtue of, of serendipity, so get ready. Um, and I'm going to get to do it, this is great. So super chickens, uh, there was an, ev uh, an evolutionary biologist, I think at Purdue, uh, Muir. William Muir is his name, and he studied chickens like you do, and he was interested in productivity to see if there's something that he can do about the combination of different personalities, different uh, genomes, phenotypes, interacting together, and his measure, as you might imagine, is the amount of eggs that, that they would um, uh, yield. Is that, is that the correct verb for? Okay. <laughs> I did soybean stuff. I did stuff with plants. I never worked with actual feathered uh, soybeans. Anyway, the chickens live, live in a group, and um, if you put a lot of high egg-laying chickens in a group of moderate and low-laying chickens, they sort of, the, the average goes slightly up and everybody's fine and no big deal. But if you select the best-laying chicken out of lots of populations and you create a population that is artificially inflated with only super chickens, they kill each other in a matter of weeks. <laughs> it's true, research. So it, it takes six generations of, of this culling and, and all super chickens are dead. So my takeaway from this is that the 10x engineer is real. There, there, there exists such a thing as a single super chicken that can elevate uh, the, the, the output and the morale and the integrity and the, the personality and the joy of a team. But if you put too many super chickens in there, then, then you create these pernicious uh, relationships between them that actually detract more than they add to what it is that you're trying to achieve. I'll give you another example. Uh, I didn't want to be cruel, but that's Charles of Spain. Charles of Spain had no voice in how he came out, right? Like he was born and, and just like all of us, he just fell into whatever his vessel was going to be. I'm not going to complain. I, I know like I, I'm white and I pass and I have all sorts of of opportunities that are granted to me because of the way that I'm the whitest Brazilian you will meet. Um, and yes, I am Brazilian, born and raised. Uh, so 
What happened here is that um, the same thing that happens genetically and phenotypically to, to royal families that do a lot of, of inbreeding for wanting to maintain purity, they're doing the same thing that they did to, to the super chickens, essentially. And so what ends up happening is that you end up, if you do that in your team, so not chickens, not inbreeding, um, but in your team, if you only bring in people from the same uh, universities, from the same programs, the same disciplines, the same domains, the same age groups, the same uh, demographics, the same original geographies, who speak the same computer languages, who speak the same natural languages, who have never gone through what it means to have to transliterate what's happening on screen to their mom. Right, so when, when something crazy goes on the news and my mom is asking me what's going on, I don't tell her exactly word for word what's on the TV because they're going to be using idioms and they're going to be using uh, jargon and shorthand that doesn't map to what her mental map of a vernacular is. And I have to do those ETLs on the fly. Um, that's something that you need to have at your disposal in a team-wide environment so that every single player is bringing something, or not necessarily, I mean, it's a traveling salesman problem, it is not trivial to compute if you actually want to go out and see how many of each kind and, and at what level you start having diminishing returns. I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader. I've not gone through that. But personally, my, my heuristics are of the last four teams that I have built from the ground up uh, to deliver on data science uh, promises that companies make to the, to the, to the street. Um, this, is, this is by far the method that has worked best for me. And I think one of the things that you want to avoid, obviously you don't want to cause intellectual inbreeding. That's usually not something that anybody sets out to do. But what does end up happening is you have these meritocracies, which aren't necessarily meritocracies, which that's a whole other semantic discussion of whether or not that's a curse, McCurse word that I would use, but I'm not, because holy ground. Um, I don't believe in meritocracies. I think they, they are a, a ridiculous exercise in self-pretension, but I'll talk over drinks with you if you want to discuss it. But the, the survivorship bias is, I think, something that we really don't, um, don't talk a lot about much, because what you're trying to do as you build a really solid kick-ass team, kick-butt team, I'm from Boston, this is so hard. Um, is that, you know, there's this, this cartoon by David Whitaker, um, which I find just incredibly insightful, which is that w what we think we know, we think of it as just this fraction of all that is knowable, and then we just join everybody else's knowable as if it's this matrix-like, goo soup that you can just plug in and like, oh, I can fight Kung Fu now. That's not how it works. Everybody has a finite amount. Some of the bubbles are a little bit bigger. Some of the bubbles are a little bit smaller. But really what you have is some little, uh, little small bubbles here about one topic and another bubble here and another bubble here. And when you have lots of people together, what you're trying to do is to plug the gaps. You're trying to figure out what those edges are. And if you have any edges that don't overlap, that tells you who's your next person that you need to hire. And you, personally, I don't hire for race, I don't hire for gender, I don't hire for mathematicians, I don't hire for, for engineers. I hire for what is it that my team needs. And then I bring that person in and I interview lots of people who meet those. But that goes, for me, that goes into the job description. I want somebody who has experience managing a power plant in Saudi Arabia. Don't ask me why I needed that. I did. I found him. But you need to really figure out of the things that you're being asked to deliver, what are the, the gaps, what are the lack of overlaps, and build that. Now, as you build your teams, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And why would you want to skin a cat? Because they're adorable. But uh, the joke aside, and. It's, it's CSV conference, I needed a cat picture, I just did. But this is to remind me, there's a, there's a, a really interesting um, 
research paper from Amy Amundsen uh, on, and she did it with um, the, there's a, a Google research team doing things on just people skills, and Amy Allenson was, was heading one of these, and she found that the thing that makes teams more um, competent, with the definition of competency being meeting all of the measures as defined by the overlords of Google, which it, it, it's, it's, it's a well-established test whether I agree with, with the parameters or not, but they did find that the one thing that, cor so size of team didn't correlate with improved outcomes. Um, the uh, seniority, the average seniority of the people or the, the, the variance of seniority within teams, none of that matter. It turns out that you could control for all of that and not have any significant impact. Uh, in the outcome. The one thing that made a difference is psychological safety and low anxiety. So what you're doing is you're building a team that is capable of, have, of feeling psychological safety and feeling low anxiety. Now, I'm a wimp, so <laughs> I need a lot of, of tolerance for my level of neurosis. But not everybody does that, and I have been in teams that don't abide by somebody with my level of neuroses, and we don't work well together. That's fine. The point is to identify that soon enough to find a team where that's exactly the, the, the skill uh, or the ability that will plug a hole uh, in your team. Have you ever uh, heard of those Testudo um, formations from the Romans, like in Sparta, where they have the rectangle and everybody has their shield and they form like a perfect cube, everybody's protected from the incoming arrows and everything. What happens is you have one person that just drops their shield and there's a perfect entry point for, for things to go wrong. So as, as you're building your team, the whole point is to create one of those where it's almost hermetically sealed and the arrows of your enemies uh, can't make it through. Again, mistakes can be made. So it took me a long time to get to a point where I am uh, better at building these teams, at coaching these teams, at telling teammates that, that they've grown too far, too high, and they need to move on to bigger and better pastures. That's a really hard conversation to have because that opens up your, your overlap whole again, and you have to go find somebody else that will be a good match for that team. Um, so sometimes you, do you guys see what's wrong with this picture, by the way? Yes, okay, good. So a couple of mistakes that can be made. What are the, what are the common blind spots that you have? So as you're building blended teams, data analysis until, you know, at some point, we will have greater definitions of what it is that we do. I think you know it's between eight and thirty years for some kind of of coalescence uh, on the on the nomenclature. But in the interim, I'll keep talking. Um, so a couple of common blind spots that we have: software engineers. Software engineers often this is not a, a one to one. I'm not saying everybody on column A sucks at column B. That's not it. But software engineers can have often uh, blind spots in terms of sampling. They're like, just give me the data and I will just engineer it beautifully and I will plug it and I will do it. And they, there's this assumption that the, time, the data that they have received um, has been looked at, clean, detailed, whatever. And so if you have somebody who performs that kind of work and works together with that software engineer, that blind spot goes away like that. It's magical. They suddenly feel in a very visceral way that this is my colleague and the thing that I don't understand that this person does is this thing that I take for granted. Uh, deep learners, they have a, a, a slight lack of rigorous statistics. Funnily enough, I know that sounds insane, totally true, because deep learners are coming at it from a computer science bend, which, um, which sometimes makes it so that they don't have um, rigorous analysis, and I'm talking about like math analysis and topology and those kinds of, of concepts that, that they can use as, as they articulate what they're doing. And so you have a lot of folks saying, well, these models are not understandable. These models are not understandable. And that's not true. 
these models are not easily understandable. Um, I don't know that we have the technology, the know-how, or the expertise to get there, but give it 10 years, these models are understandable. We just need to, we just need to learn how to chunk them in ways just like we've done everything else. I mean, the government is not understandable. The government is ultra complex, but you, you, you separate different pieces and you, and you federate and suddenly uh, you, I, I think we're going to have, okay. I think we're going to have AI sociologists. I think we're going to have a discipline of people who go and investigate why is it that AI makes decisions the way it does, same way that we have people who study humans and why it is that they make decisions the way they do when the rationale for their decisions is also below their level of awareness. I think that's how I would like to think about AI is they're computers, they know why they're doing it, it's just very complex and very probabilistic and it makes it difficult to understand. Uh, that's a tangent, sorry. PhDs, I don't have one, so not that I'm biased or anything. Um, what they lack is shippedness. They don't have a ship it bone in their body. <laughs> Y'all are special. Um, because you, you care for truth, you, care, you are doctors of the philosophy of your dom domain. Right, I get it, that's what I want from you, but also I want you to realize that for the magic to take place, humans at the end of the line have to purchase a physical or digital product that has been launched and marketed and priced. It has to leave the bench. So if you have somebody who doesn't have that kind of, of, of background or expertise, like me, um, that's the kind of conversation that you can have and you can have that conversation with, with intensity because I can feel that pain in a much more visceral way than, um, than the person who's not feeling that pain. And that's why it's important to have all of those different kinds uh, of players in your team. Managers, I'm gonna jump there. Well, st statisticians, because I'm one, uh, we suck at unit tests. We're just like, but it's intuitively obvious that by the setup of this equation, it follows that. What are you asking me about? I'm asking because I don't have a PhD in statistics. And I'm like, no, neither do I, et cetera. But it, it's, it's something that we really suck at until you work with a computer scientist who tells you the benefits and why and, and all of the uh, nuances that go into it and how to set it up and here are the six git commands that you need to learn, don't worry about it, just learn these six. And you work together in, in, in a way that a true organic team works together versus two professors debating it with swords. Um, and then the last one, managers. Hi, I'm a manager right now, uh, I'm recovering data scientist but now manager. Which means I'm useless because my, um, my drive is to keep the team running and to make money so that I can reward my team, which is really close to p-hacking. So I have to constantly worry that I am not asking my team to p-hack the data that they are so uh, excited to show me, and then I tell them, no, we need, the answer needs to be this, and then they're like, no, Angela, the answer can't be whatever we want it to be, the answer is. So. Beware of managers. It's, even when we, even when we try really hard, we're also also susceptible to these blind spots that everybody on the team has, and that's the point. So, what you're doing when you're hiring for for the topologists and, and analytical geometrists uh, in in the audience, what you're doing is you're doing a multiple. Uh, a multiple objective decision analysis problem where you have a multidimensional set of things that you want to optimize and you want to find not everybody who has the best perspectives on everything, the most senior, who has exposure to the most number of disciplines, who speaks the most number of languages, but you want to find that, that distribution that has the compound value that outweighs the rest. It's a very complicated uh, computing process. I wouldn't advocate actually doing it. Uh, but once you have a team that you've inherited that is there and you are, you've assessed them and you want them to stay, um, as you're going to, to augment that team, I would say that you should use a framework like this to make sure that you're not creating um, uh, uh, aggregations 
of, of skill at the expense of skills that you're not going to have represented in your teams. So how do you interview for these things? Um, these are my favorite questions. Um, essentially, I want to know how self-aware are you? That's the key that I want to get at because if you're not self-aware to tell me what you're good at and what you're not good at, then I can't fit you in the slots that are good and not good and then I can't hire you. So I want to know about your past projects and I want to know what did you learn and I want to know can you tell me about it. So I'm testing their communication, I'm testing their understanding of the modeling, I'm testing their understanding of the whole process that things have to go through. But I'm also trying to understand where they're not excellent at, not because I'm going to then not hire them, but because I'm going to have a much better understanding of what price I'm paying for that balance that I seek. So does that make sense? Silence, okay. So then the last piece, after you've built these, uh, this team that is well balanced and works well together, um, great, now what? The end. Drinks. No, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that to Karthik. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go back to uh, uh, Gillard Spavka's um, slide, which I think is really phenomenal, because this is the next step. This is what we need to do. This is the how. So you need to apply all of the skills that we know onto the, the processes that we need to, to walk through. So as you're dealing with data collection, you need to worry about that data collection and uh, the biases that can be introduced. As you're dealing with uh, cleansing data and transforming data, you need to worry about your data engineering and do you have any control over what's happening there, how many black, blo black boxes are doing your ETLs for you. Uh, in terms of modeling and validating, there's a lot of ethical concerns that go into that, that perhaps having ethicists or sociologists or ethnographers uh, pipe in and give insight as to where things are maybe veering a bit off from, from where you would want to. Um, in terms of communication, you have to worry about security, security of your data, security of your message, security of your customer's data. Um, and because this is the business uh, side of the world, you have to worry about uh, when you deploy what the ROI is, and ROI is return on investment, I'm sorry, um, jargon. But uh, it's important because this is what fuels the ability to keep having uh, more and more fun things to work on. So your data team's responsibilities are, and this is set in stone, and this I print it out and I give to everybody who joins my team. We care about data, we're a data science team and you know, the unicorn and everybody's special and it takes a couple of, I was gonna say days, but it's weeks to get everybody off their high horse. It does, there's nothing to it. And then you get them to, 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 to understand that they need to focus on data quality, data collection, data engineering, security, ethics, communication, and the return on, on the investment from their shareholders, their benefactors, whoever they may be. Um, and so, why? Why do you have to care about those things? Why, why are those cares incumbent upon a data team? Why aren't those cares incumbent upon the investment management team um, or the PR team? Well, usually because nobody has cared about it this way until now. And I want to give my perspective on it, which is, it's not that they are nefarious, it's not that they haven't cared about this because they're evil and they want the world to burn. It's just that they're not aware. It's not what they do, it's not what they've been trained to do, it's not what, what they've been trained to worry about. You have many folks who are, and, and those are great to have in your team as well, but if you only seek folks who have that skill set already developed, then you lose this amazing opportunity to, say, to take somebody on who doesn't understand that yet and, and figure out what is it that 
the team needs to worry about and they'll bring fresh perspectives and they will challenge the status quo processes and they will say does this still this process that we instituted in the dark ages of 2014 does that still apply to our data pipelines in 2017 so it's not that no one cares is that folks are unprepared to care everybody wants to be a care bear they don't know how and have you guys seen the care bears yeah, come on. <laughs> so the problem with the Care Bears, there was one episode where they all went and they did their big thing that comes out of their belly and they ruined everything because it wasn't the right thing to do and they destroyed this nice little pond with their magical energy and the pond became over, magically ponded and, you know. <laughs> It was terrible. And that's just because they didn't have enough information. They didn't know what it is they needed to do. And they came in and they, they said, how hard could it be? We're just going to fix everything. And how hard can it be are the death knell words on anything because it's hard. So when should you start caring now that you know that you have to start caring? And it's, it's on you and it's not on anybody else's yet unless you, you work in a company large enough where they've already had data leaks and then they went out and, and hire people to worry about it. But companies that haven't gone through it yet, it's incumbent upon you to care and it's incumbent upon you to care now. I'm, I'm not going to do Arnold because I'm no good, but you can feel him, right? <laughs> okay. Because when you come in, what you expect uh, as a new member, uh, you want to have this magical data lake that is shaped just so for all of your needs and all of the formats are going to be standardized. You're going to have continuous integration already available. Permissions and access controls are in place so people who shouldn't be seeing information are not seeing information and everything is, is uh, sometimes even air gapped so that you don't have um, exchange of data uh, that, that shouldn't be there. You have your IoT ingestion taken care of because half of your IoT information is coming from the, the North, Northern Virginia pipe. Some of your IoT data is coming from Tokyo and you have to munge all of that together and normalize it. And everything is already done. There's a process, there's a script, you press a button, everything is magical. Um, performance is measured and you have a dedicated teammate who's worried about performance so they know when there's a dip. Um, there's automated data quality control and automated uh, anomaly detection algorithms. You have APIs exposed to the rest of the business. If you're advanced enough, you have APIs exposed to the rest of the world as open APIs, which then you've already gone through the whole process of, de -aggreg of aggregating and de-anonymizing. De it's beautiful, right? Yeah. Because this is what actually exists. It's this sewage pipe full of plumbing. And you have like this little lake over here that's a little dark blue. You don't know if it's got a little bit of cobalt. You have this other little blob over here. It looks a little green. Might have too much iron in there. And don't know how safe is it. You're going to have to go in there with your your scuba gear and investigate, spelunk a little bit, is this healthy that I'm going to have to clean it before I can make any use of it? Is it worth the effort of cleaning it all? That yellow one, I don't, I don't know if that's sulfur, I don't want to go, so I don't have the sulfur swimming gear. I mean, you get the point. It's what you end up inheriting has been built for other purposes. Unless, unless you, your company started out as a data company and that's very lucky. For my role, for instance, the last three companies that I joined, I joined to start a data science program. They didn't have one. They had all of these other things. And I think this picture, even though I'm being facetious and I'm saying like, ha, job security. But no, what I think, what I think this says is that this is a good company to join. Um, giving you tips if you ever want to leave the indie world, make some money, and then come back, which is my plan. Um, what, what happens is they build their, their infrastructure, their data lakes, their processes um, for the, the, the job that they were asked to do. And until somebody came in with the mandate of looking at data and worrying about data and treating data as an asset and, an, and a liability, potentially, um, 
things already look like this, and, and part of having that data science discipline become something that is um, not an afterthought, but truly part of the strategy of the leadership of the company, means recognizing that those guys didn't over-engineer anything. Right, like this, to me, means the teams that came before deserve rounds of applause because they didn't over-engineer. They didn't build more than they were asked to build. They built for the specifications of what they had been asked. And now part of that is transforming what's, what's extant, the legacy work, into something that you can now automate and, and, and transform into the pre-Willy Wonka uh, uh, chocolate factory uh, work. Now, if you've done this a few times, or if you've worked in companies that have forced you to feel this pain, uh, you will realize that the heart can get really cold when all you've known is winter. And I'm here to tell you that there is something after winter. It's really easy. It's really easy uh, to care. Um, all you have to do is leave breadcrumbs. So imagine this scene in accounting. I'm gonna I'm gonna play you a picture. New person comes into a company and they go into HR and HR goes, oh, yep, you're in accounting. Go talk to accounting. But they don't say where accounting is. So new person is walking down the hallway trying to find accounting and they're like, do you know where accounting is? Oh yeah, it's right there. And then you get into accounting and you go, what should I do? And they're like, oh yeah, here's your onboarding because we've been doing this for 300 years. We know ledgers and credit and debit and lines of things and assets and liabilities. These are well understood processes. I'm not trivializing them, they're not easy, but they are known. In data science, what ends up happening is somebody goes, why did we, um, the, the analog would have been somebody goes to an accountant at the company and says, why did we divest that $30 million asset and the answer is, oh, well, yeah, I think Janet might know something about that. There was a git push somewhere. Like, no, the government would not allow that to happen. You need to have forms upon forms upon forms filed with the SEC of the rationale and why it is that you're going to do these things. So we don't have those kinds of processes uh, in data science yet. I think if we keep pushing the envelope and having black box algorithms that judge whether or not somebody should be sentenced to life in prison or five minutes in the yard, that's, that future is going to approach rapidly. But the way to do right now before there is a consensus as to what data science is as a discipline from an academic standpoint, documentation is how you program a business. You leave those breadcrumbs. Documentation is to business as code is to product. It's if I have to go and ask a human being why a business decision was made, somebody already dropped the ball because that decision should have been recorded somewhere and there should be a rationale for what that decision um, was intended to do so that it can be tracked and it can be verified and we can learn from it because not every decision is going to be perfect. And the hubris that only the perfect decisions get documented is a little bit silly because if we don't know the rate at which we make bad investments, we can't improve of those, on those. We can't understand better um, how those uh, get made. And so what is it that you should document when I say leave breadcrumbs? What breadcrumbs? Well, motivations for projects, not just results from projects, but what sets you down this path? Because if the project blows up, the idea didn't blow up, and you can turn left and try again and maybe find a better result. Um, the reasons for you to believe your hypotheses, either um, uh, previous papers, uh, preprints, blog posts, tweets, whatever it was that sparked the reason for you to pursue something. Uh, dead ends, document the stuff that blew up. Document stuff so that when you win the lottery and you leave and you, and you don't take your group with you and they're all left behind, allow them to be able to, um, to follow on your steps and figure out we shouldn't spend the same three months that Bob spent on this because Bob told us that it didn't work. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't prioritize those types of, of projects as the kinds of things that you show your upline, your management upline, but have it for yourselves. Uh, pause projects for the same thing, and conjectures for things that you should do next. Um, 
rules of engagement, taxonomies, um, things that will help the group. So this is more about documenting things that help the group, not that help HR or, or the leadership team or anything like that. And so what will you want to know about the data um, that you're documenting? You want to know in what format it is, uh, including any transformations, any assumptions. You want to know how fast it's moving, uh, at what volume, at what compression. You want to know from whom it's coming, what's the chain of custody around that data. You want to know if it's trustworthy, uh, if you have the chain of custody or not. You want to have some hypothesis on, on the pre and processing pre and post processing that this data has gone through, and you want to know where it's from. You want to know information about the performance, the scale, any access controls uh, that are in place, and the speed through which it moves uh, through your infrastructure. And that's the data side, the business side. So what does the business really do? Do you know? I'm not joking. McDonald's, not a food company. McDonald's is a real estate company. Look it up, I'm not kidding. Um, how does it make money? How does it create value for their customers? Who are the customers? Who's buying? Who's paying? Who are the competitors? Who's regulating? What assumptions are baked in? Um, and importantly, do you have enough data to validate your answers to these questions? Or are you just parroting the party line? It's very easy to, during the onboarding, brainwashing that takes place. You just take things as gospel, I say from the pulpit, <laughs> and you should challenge that. Don't, don't strike me, but you should challenge things that are said from the podium. <laughs> and so um, this is something that's near and dear to me. I think I, I talked about it a little bit already in that you want to optimize across all the multiple dimensions of skill. But I think having junior team members is a great forcing function. So junior team members most times don't know where in the, the multiple different skill uh, dimensions they fit. So even if they fit in many, many, many uh, dimensions closer to, to the genesis point, they're a forcing function for your more senior developers, senior data engineers, senior product managers, um, because they, they are not jaded and they can ask uh, questions that all us seniors, senior peoples um, have forgotten to ask. And that brings us full circle. This is how you build teams that work uh, to solve a problem, whether that problem is uh, a civic problem, an indie problem, or a corporate problem. And with that, I wanted to thank you all very much for spending uh, a couple of minutes listening to me, and I hope, uh, I hope it was useful. <laughs>